Okay, so we're going to start biology and we're going to talk about cell theory. Okay, but before we do that, let me ask you a question. What, if something was to be considered alive, what would it need to do or have? Uh, I, one thing comes to mind, reproduction. Okay, so it's got to be able to reproduce. Okay. Okay, what else? Produce waste. Okay. Make waste. It must be able to exchange gas. Okay. That would be oxygen and carbon dioxide, right? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay, and it must have cells. Okay, so on the rare occasion, like today, I have a class that remembers this that it must have cells to be considered alive, okay? Because most of the time, I get those three things. If I don't have cells on that list, fire is a living organism. Fire reproduces. A spark, or a, what we call a flanker, okay? One of those little embers that flies out of the campfire, okay? It goes and starts another fire. That's reproduction, it's a whole new fire, okay? Um, makes waste, yep. Okay, they definitely do that. And exchanges gases. Fire requires exactly the same gas exchange you do, oxygen for carbon dioxide. Okay, so by that logic, if we don't brainstorm cells as something a living organism has to have, fire becomes a living organism, which of course it's not, it's a chemical reaction. Doesn't it only need at least one cell? It doesn't need multiple cells. Well, I, I say cells, but yeah, one cell. It can be single cell. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let me ask you this. Is a virus a living organism? No, yes. And therein lies the debate. Viruses don't have cells. No. A virus is a coat, a shell of protein with genetic material inside. A, set, a virus does not exchange gases. It does not produce waste. And in fact, cannot reproduce on its own. Okay? A virus is an intracellular parasite. Okay, does anyone know how a virus works? Okay, like after COVID, we shall be relatively familiar on how that works. Okay, so what a virus does is it latches on to your cell. Okay, most of them are adapted to certain types of cells, but we'll just say your cell to be general. Okay, it attaches to your cell. Okay, so something like this. Okay, so here's your cell. Okay, and the virus. Okay, can kind of latch onto it, and its genetic material will then be injected into the cell. Right? At that point, the protein coat is now redundant. It's gone. It will just sit there on the edge of the cell. Okay? But that genetic material gets into your cell. Now, cells know what genetic material is for. It's for making things. Okay? In, in your DNA, part of your DNA codes for uh, making adrenaline, and some of it codes for making insulin, and some of it codes for making keratin, which is what your fingernails and hair are made out of. Okay? Every part of your DNA is a set of instructions on how to build something that your body or cells requires. So, when your cell sees a, a piece of DNA floating around inside the cell, it knows that that shouldn't be there. DNA is supposed to be in the nucleus where it's all protected and safe. So it will immediately take that DNA and put it in the nucleus with all of your DNA. Okay? Now, a virus, a viral piece of viral DNA will simply splice itself into your DNA. Okay? So, what do you suppose that little piece of viral DNA is instructions for? Produce something. What? More yeah, to make more of itself. That piece of viral DNA is the instructions for making that virus. Okay, just like all the DNA in your cells is instructions for making you. Okay, if I had a cloning machine, if such a thing existed, okay, I could just take one of your cells and I could make a copy of you. Okay, well, that's what viruses do. They take their DNA and their DNA gets spliced into yours. So let's say it happened to replace the section of your DNA that codes for something you would make a lot of. Insulin comes to mind. 
Okay? Your cells have to make that all the time. So it splices itself in for that section. And then your cell's like, hey, we need some insulin. Blood sugar's getting a little high here. You know, we need to get that sugar absorbed. So we need some insulin. So the nucle nucleolus goes and finds a section of DNA that's supposed to code for insulin, makes a copy of it, sends that out to the appropriate place, and the instructions are followed. What got made? A virus. A virus. Okay, which, okay, one virus inside the cell, no big deal. But the problem is the feedback loop that gets created here. The cell wanted insulin, and it didn't get it. So it goes full Karen mode, okay, and starts screaming for more insulin because it didn't get what it wanted. Okay, it's like, hey, where's my insulin? And, and the cell's like, oh, oh sorry, sorry, we'll, we'll get that. And it goes to that section of DNA, makes a copy, sends it out to get made, and what does it make? A virus. Another virus. Well, that process just keeps happening because, you know, the part of your cell that wanted the insulin is Karen and is screaming for it, and it's not getting what it wants, so it just keeps screaming, okay? and Eventually, your cell is so full of viruses that it just pops. And all those viruses get out. Now, only a small fraction of them are going to succeed in infecting another cell. Most of them will just die within minutes of being created and released. Okay? Because they can't metabolize any energy. They can't exchange gases. Right? They can't do anything. They just float around. Well, eventually, they're just consumed and degraded. Okay? Um, but a small fraction of them will manage to infect another cell. So let's say you had that one single virus that we just talked about, it infected a cell. That cell made 100 viruses, okay? Let's say five of them are successful. They go out and infect five more cells. Each one of those five cells makes 100 viruses. And only five of them are successful, but you see what's happening with the numbers, okay? That's why you know, you go to bed at night and you're like, oh, I got a tickle in my throat. I hope I'm not getting sick. And then you wake up in the morning and you're like, oh, God, I'd have to get better to die. Like, you're just so sick, right? Like, it's just awful because overnight, that exponential growth of viruses, okay, has taken over. And now your body has a full blown infection going on that it's got to fight, okay? Now, the problem with fighting a virus is that. They're incredibly small. Your immune system is not going to go out and find all the millions of viruses that are in your bloodstream now okay, and try to kill them. Because that's not a good use of its energy. Only a small fraction of those are going to succeed in infecting another cell. And they're hard to find anyway. So what it does is it goes looking for cells that are infected. Okay? And when it finds them, it's like, uh, you're infected. you got to take one for the team now. Okay? And it'll actually kill its own cells. Right? That's why you get so weak when you have a viral infection. Your body's fighting itself. Okay? It's destroying cells that are infected to keep them from making more viruses. Okay? That's why things like HIV are so insidious. What cells do they infect? Yeah, your immune cells. So your immune system cells are infected. The immune system cells come over and try to destroy that cell. Now, they're infected too. Okay, so it, it, that eventually will break down your immune system. Okay, um, and that's what usually happens to people in the latter stages. Okay, that sort of making sense. Okay, so a virus. There's a lot of debate. Is a virus truly a living thing? By our current definition, it isn't. It doesn't do any of the things a living thing is supposed to be able to do. It's not made of cells. Okay? It doesn't carry out any of these basic functions, okay? including this one, because a virus doesn't just pop in half and like a cell does. It doesn't make a copy of itself. Okay? It hijacks your cell and makes your cell copy it. Okay? So it doesn't even really reproduce on its own. Making sense? Okay? That's kind of why a lot of the things we went through during COVID, you know, like we were you know, spraying off the desks and you know, doing all of that kind of stuff. There, if a virus gets on the desk, it's not going to live very long. Okay? It can't do anything on its own. Right? Viruses will die in pretty short order okay, outside of the body. Now, if there happens to be an infected cell there, that would be a problem. Okay? So when someone sneezes on you, okay, it's not so much that maybe there were viruses in the sneeze, okay, but maybe there, some cells came off too. Your cells slough off very easily. 
okay? And they could have carried some of it with you as well. Not to say that a virus couldn't easily travel from one person to another. In the right situation, like breathing on someone or you know, kissing them or something like that, you could easily transfer the viruses as well, along with cells. Okay? All right, making some sense? Okay, so um, what kind of cell is that there in that picture? Okay, plant cell, all right, how can you tell? Okay, it's got a cell wall. What else does it have? Chloroplasts. Yeah, it's got chloroplasts. Those carry out photosynthesis. Animal cells wouldn't have those. Okay. Now there's one other thing that animal cells don't have, and it's this water vacuole here. It has a role to play that animal cells wouldn't need it for. Okay, we'll talk about that in a bit. Okay, so the cell theory has three points. Notice the pattern here. Like we started out with atomic theory and chemistry, okay, like the basis for chemistry, and then now we're talking about the cell theory, which is you know cells are the basic unit of biology, okay, and atoms are the basic unit of chemistry. All right, so the, in the cell theory, the first point is that all organisms are made of cells. Some are unicellular, so one cell, okay. And others are multicellular, like ourselves or a cactus. Okay, the second point of the cell theory is the one that we come back to the most, okay? And it is that cells carry out the basic functions of an organism, okay? Those things we brainstormed, consuming food, producing waste, exchanging gases, being able to reproduce, okay? Those are all basic functions of an organism, okay? If I was to remove any cell from your body and put it in, you know, a place where it had access to, you know, the things it needs, okay? it would survive, okay? It could survive on its own, okay? Cells can carry out the basic functions of the organism, okay? We come back to that a lot because we talk about how organisms function quite a bit in this unit, so we're always talking about, okay, cells do this, cells do that. It's always a basic function of the organism. Right? And the third point talks about where cells come from. Okay? Cells come from the division of existing cells. There's no place in your body that just manufactures cells. Okay? There's no cell factory. It's like, oh, I need a skin cell. Let's make some of those. That's not how it works. Okay? Cells divide to make more. Okay? That's the only place they can come from. Okay? It's actually one of the miracles of creation, okay, is that you started out as a single cell, okay? So when sperm met egg, okay, the fertilized egg is called the zygote. It's a single cell, okay? That cell divides countless times over and over and over again. And eventually, okay, over the course of, you know, 40 weeks, okay, you are born. Okay, you are created. Right? In fact, that is part of the reason why the Catholic Church believes that abortion is wrong. Okay? Because in the mind or the view of the Catholic Church, all of the potential for you as a person is present at the moment of conception. Okay? And there's a scientific backing for that. You are the combination of your mom's DNA and your dad's DNA. And as soon as that egg is fertilized, you have the 46 chromosomes that are necessary to build you. At that moment, all of the genetic potential for you as a person is present. Okay? That's why the Catholic Church has that standing. It is because you are there now. Okay? All of the genetics for you as a unique individual creation of God is there. Okay, so that's, you don't have to necessarily agree with that, I'm just telling you why, okay, the Catholic Church has that sense. Okay? 
Okay? They believe that at the moment, the gen genetic potential for a person is there. That person is there. Okay? All right. Now, the process of cell division is delicate and precise. And it has to be. Because if something goes wrong, the cell, one of the cells, or even both of them, may die. Okay? So the first thing a cell has to do before it can divide is it has to make sure that both cells will have all of the DNA. So it's got to copy it all. Okay? Because that each, each daughter cell, that's what they're called when they divide, a daughter cell. Okay? Each daughter cell needs to have all 46 chromosomes. They have to be perfectly intact. There can't be any mistakes. That's the first thing that has to happen is copy all the DNA. If something goes wrong during that copying, then one or both of the cells will be missing something. Okay? One of the pieces of the instructions for how to operate that cell could be missing okay? and, or could be duplicated. Okay? That can be equally bad. Right? And that cell then may malfunction. There's all sorts of genetic disorders that actually are the result of having too little or, in a lot of cases, too much DNA. Okay? Does anyone know someone who has Down syndrome? Okay? So Down syndrome is caused by a trisomy. Okay? It means that instead of having two copies of every chromosome, they have three copies of chromosome 21. Okay? Down syndrome is trisomy 21. It means they have three copies of that one chromosome. Okay? Does that have pretty serious implications for that person? Yeah. Having Down syndrome, you know, there's physical, um, you know, problems there. Uh, there's obviously the intellectual problems, okay? And they actually tend to not live quite as long as everyone else because having that trisomy means that some of the organs, you know, don't last as long, okay? Typically, the life expectancy is a little bit lower, okay? And the reason for that is that they have a genetic disorder, okay? And they have too much of that DNA, and that can cause problems. Too much of a good thing can be can be a problem, okay? Lots of trisomies are so severe that the, um, that the, the baby or the embryo or fetus um, doesn't survive, okay? In fact, some of them are so severe that a woman might not even realize she was even pregnant, okay? The trisomy is so severe that the embryo dies at a very early stage, okay? Because it just, the cells just won't work, okay? Some trisomies, you know, the, the, they'll live a, a full life, like someone with Down syndrome. They, that, you know, they'll come, they'll come, be birthed, and they'll live a full life. Okay, um, but some trisomies will not. And deficiencies, not having enough, is almost always um, something that will not work. Okay, so that process of copying the DNA is really crucial. So, do they copy like all of the parts of the cell? Um, they don't copy all the parts of the cell. The DNA gets copied, but usually the reason a cell divides is because it's reached a size where it's gotten too big to function efficiently, and that usually triggers the division process. Okay, um, So then it'll copy the DNA, and because it's gotten so big, there's usually enough of everything inside the cell for it to, to survive until it can produce more once it's split. Right? So um, you know, there's enough mitochondria for both cells to get along until they can make more. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's a pretty delicate process, but it is the only process by which cells are made, by the division of existing cells, okay? All right, so in chemistry, there were lots of people to remember. In biology, there are four. Here's the best part of it. One of them is a physicist. He actually had zero interest in biology but he invented the most important instrument biology has. You're welcome, biology, physics rocks. Okay, so what Hooke was doing was he was experimenting with lens series or lens combinations. He was putting different lenses in you know, a tube together to see what effect that would have on the image that was created. Okay, so while he was doing that, he invented the microscope. Okay. He also invented essentially the telescope as well, okay. lens series and magnify in different ways. Okay. So he developed this thing and he's like, okay, you know, when I stick my finger under here, it looks bigger. Okay, maybe I can see other things that are smaller than my finger. Right? So what he did is he took a piece of cork, 
Okay, I don't know, maybe he drank on the job and he had a wine bottle around. I don't know. He had a cork. Okay? And so he took the cork and he sliced it really thin and he put it under the microscope. Where does cork come from? Trees. Yeah, it comes from a tree. A tree's a living organism, right? It's made of cells? Mm -hmm. Okay, is cork living or dead? Dead. Dead. Okay, the kind of cork you use in a wine bottle okay, is dead. So, when he put it under the microscope, this is what he saw. Little rooms. Like in a prison or a monastery. What do we call the little rooms in a prison or a monastery? Cells. cells. Okay. He thought they were empty. That's why he called them cells, because the cells in a prison okay, or in a monastery are generally pretty empty. They live, you know, monks who live in a monastery live a pretty Spartan lifestyle. They don't have much in there. Okay. He thought they were empty little rooms, so he called them cells. And then he got bored because it wasn't physics, and he's like, here, have this. I jest, of course, you know that, right? But I just, I love physics, so. Okay, so um, that was 1665. Now, his microscope wasn't very powerful, okay? I mean, more research and development had to be done, okay? But 30 times magnification was significant at the time. All right, so what did Hook do? Hook discovered cells. Invented the first microscope and discovered cells. And his microscope still looks generally like a microscope looks today. Not as high tech, doesn't have multiple lenses, but still generally the same shape. No lasers from this day and age, day of the future. No, no. No electron microscope. This is just a light microscope, right? Just bends the light through the lenses. Okay? So incidentally, if we're talking about microscopes and we're going to do a microscopy lab next week, okay, let's talk about how this thing worked. Okay, so we'll simplify this with just a single lens. Okay, so that's my lens. All right, um, up here will be the eye. That's an eye, not a sun, it's an eye. Okay, now, um, if you're looking at something really, really small, okay, underneath the microscope, so I'm gonna go and say, uh, I'm gonna make a triangle just because it's easier to demonstrate what I'm talking about here. Okay, so we're looking at this little triangular object. Okay, how a light microscope works is that light comes off of the specimen and hits okay, the lens. What do lenses do to light? Refract it. Yeah, they refract it. They bend it. Okay, they change its path. So as those light rays go through the lens, they're bent, and their path is altered. Okay, so what ends up happening is this little triangle is now going to be, whoops, this electric tool. No, I want the triangle. Yes. I'll put it back, guys. I just need to copy it here for a second. Okay, so now that thing looks much bigger because the light that came from one corner of it, this corner, ends up over here. The light that came from this part ends up way up there, and the part that came from here ends up over there. Okay, and so now the object has been magnified. Everyone follow how that kind of works? That's going to be important for explaining in your hypothesis for the next lab how a microscope works. So if you haven't already drawn that diagram, you should draw it and label how a microscope works because that will be important for later. Okay, so the light goes through a lens, okay, the lens refracts it, or bends it, okay, and results in the image being magnified. Now, that triangle also got mirrored, right, it got flipped. Okay, we call it a real image because it's backwards.
Okay, that oh shoot, I left that recording. Okay, that sort of makes sense. Okay, so that's how the microscope went. That's what Hook discovered. Okay, he also had additional lenses that could provide additional magnification because his lenses were in series. He had the objective lens, which is the only one I drew here, and there's also an ocular lens. Okay, that does additional magnification. Our uh, microscopes also work that way. Okay, so that's Hook. He discovered cells, but the cells he looked at were dead. dead. Okay, so he didn't notice just how incredible a cell is, how much is going on inside of a cell at all times. He didn't see any of the processes. All he saw were the cell walls of dead cells, okay, because that's what's in cork or lumber, okay, or any of that stuff. We're just using the dead supportive parts, okay, of a particular plant cell. All right, next guy who came along is Anton von Leeuwenhoek, okay, and he studied microorganisms, okay, in pond water, blood cells, you know, like prick his finger and, you know, look at the blood cells, okay, sperm cells from bulls, I don't know how he got those. <laughs> and it seems like a fine line between bravery and science there, but, um, okay, and uh, he looked at them and he had a different style of microscope that fortunately didn't catch on because it was pretty hard to use. Okay, kind of looked like a ping pong paddle, right? Uh, and it required a fairly bright light source, okay? And, you know, like a plain flat wall or a screen to essentially be used effectively. Now, here's the difference between Hook and Leeuwenhoek. Leeuwenhoek, he looked at living cells. He was the first person to view cells as they carry out the basic functions of the organism. I mean, if you look at pond water under a microscope, it is full of so many things. Once you do that, you will never, ever be tempted to drink pond water ever again. Okay? There's lots of stuff in there swimming around all the time, including things that could possibly make you sick. Okay? Like the types of amoebas that cause amoebic dysentery, okay? which would have you in the bathroom for days. It actually is a major health concern in underprivileged nations where there's no access to clean water. Okay? Um, these amoebas can cause dysentery and people can get so sick that they die of dehydration. They just lose so much fluid okay? um, that way. So he saw lots of living things. Okay? He observed what they do. Okay? Um, you know, saw them uh, you know, when they would divide. He witnessed all of that stuff. Okay? So he knew that cells were actually living things. Right? So, an important step there, um, cells are not just in cork, they're in everything. All right, then probably the two most important people in terms of the cell theory, because they're the ones who inevitably came up with it, okay? We are looking at Matthias Schleiden and Theodor Schwann, okay? Two Swedish scientists, okay, who took Leeuwenhoek's work as well as their own, and researched until they could prove their hypothesis. Okay. So Schleiden and Schwann's hypothesis was something along these lines. If cells are the basic unit of life, and tissue samples from many types of different organisms are viewed under the microscope, then cells will be present in all of the samples. Pretty simple hypothesis, okay? So they spent years looking at samples from a wide variety of living things, okay? Pond water, fungi, plants, animals, okay? Microorganisms, okay? All kinds of things like that, okay? And they found that cells were present in everything they looked at. Right. Now, this is still light microscope territory, okay? Nobody knows about viruses yet because those weren't discovered until we had the electron microscope, okay? But I would argue that viruses are not truly living organisms, okay? They are an infectious particle, okay? um, Because they don't do all the things that it says in the cell theory. Okay, so once they had confirmed or accepted that hypothesis, and so had other people, it became the cell theory the first point of it, okay? All living things are made of cells, okay? They also, in all of this research, were able to observe what cells do. After all, they had an oil immersion lens, 
Okay, that could magnify up to 600 times, which is greater than the ones that we have. Okay. Ours go up to 400, incidentally. Okay. Theirs go up to 600. So they were able to observe many cellular processes and figure out what exactly the cells were doing. And they realized that they're doing exactly the same things a large organism does. So, second point of the cell theory. Cells carry out the basic functions of the organism. And, of course, in observing as many cells as they did, they also observed them dividing. And they never found any other way for cells to multiply. They never observed cells being produced in any way other than binary fission. And that is that they split in half. Right? So third point of the cell theory, okay, cells are produced by the division of existing cells. Okay? That was their research. That is, they are credited with the cell theory. Questions on that? Okay. So what do you need to know for, let's say, maybe a quiz on Friday of next week? Okay. Cell theory stuff. Okay. No hook, Leben hook, sliding and swan. Okay. Um, know the three points of the cell theory. Stuff like that. Okay. For sure. Okay. Now, if I show you these two cells. Okay. Plant cells and animal cells. Are they different? Yeah. yeah. Are they more different or more the same? More the same. They're way more the same. Yeah. Okay. Animals and plant cells are incredibly similar. Okay. They have far more structures and processes in common than they have different. Okay. Um, for example, they both have a nucleus, okay, which holds the DNA of the cell. Okay? They both have a Golgi apparatus that packages materials to be removed from the cell or exported from the cell. Okay? They both have mitochondria, those little sausage-shaped things that carry out cellular respiration, that take in the oxygen, you know, uh, break the sugar down and release the carbon dioxide as well as the energy. Okay? You've got the two different types of endoplasmic reticulum, rough, which usually surrounds the nucleus, and smooth, which is kind of everywhere else. Okay? They, they're filled with the same fluid, cytoplasm, through which diffusion occurs. Okay? They both have a cell membrane. All right? um, lots and lots of similarities, and that's just the structures. Okay? Never mind all the biochemical processes that go on within the cell that are also the same. Okay? But when you first look at them, they're also noticeably different. Okay? Now, those differences are around how they get their energy. How do plants get their energy? From the sun, right? They carry out photosynthesis. So they're adapted around being able to carry out photosynthesis. Okay? Animals capture their food, okay? and they consume it. Since animals have to <coughs> capture their food, they have to be more flexible. That's why they don't have a cell wall. Plants stay in one place. Okay? So they have cell walls, things to strengthen them and make them strong so that they don't fall over. Okay? So most of the differences are simply around how they get their energy. But there's so much in common that the belief is that animals and plants, at some point in the distant past, shared a common ancestor. I mean, you don't look like your parents by accident, right? These two cells have a lot in common, probably because some, at some point, four billion years ago, okay, the first organisms on Earth okay, to have cells probably were you know, similar to that. Right? And then at some point, the plants and the animals diverged, and the fungi diverged, and the protists diverged. Okay? That's how evolution works. We'll talk about that later on in the unit. Okay? But the belief is that there's no way plants and animals evolved all of these structures separately and ended up looking alike. Okay? That's like, what are the odds of you having a perfect doppelganger? Okay? Not very good. Okay? I mean, there's maybe people that look similar to you, but the odds that someone would be identical to you and not be related is pretty slim. Okay? The same is true for cells. 
there's no way that plants and animals evolved all of these similar structures that look exactly the same and work exactly the same separately. Okay? They likely got them from a common ancestor who also had them. Okay? All right, sort of making sense? Okay. That's what we look at when we're trying to do what we call phylogeny. Okay. Phylogeny is the study of kind of the family tree of different organisms. Okay. If we look at all vertebrates, okay. we're vertebrates because we have a, we have vertebrate, we have a backbone. Okay. We look at all vertebrates, do we have a lot in common? Right? All vertebrates have a segmented vertebral column okay, that supports the weight of the organism through which passes a hollow nerve cord that comes down from your brain okay, and allows you know, all the motor and sensory things to go on. Okay. Now, if you put you know, a dog and a fish okay, and you look at them and you're like, well, they don't look very much alike. No, on the surface they don't. But they have a lot of things in common because mammals, reptiles, and fish all evolved from a common ancestor. Okay. It's not by accident that we have things in common, rib cage, skull, Okay, all of that kind of stuff. Making sense? Okay, that's what this kind of stuff studies. Okay, if we're looking at why do these things have similarities? Okay, where could that have come from? Why are we st are cells still doing things the same way they did three and a half, four billion years ago? Okay, what's the reason for that? That's kind of what we're looking at. Okay, now for microscopy. We don't have time for that today, but um, we'll talk about it tomorrow, okay? I'll bring in a microscope, show you how it's gonna work, okay? So that we're ready to go for our microscopy lab next week. Okay, um, so we still got, uh, what, 10 minutes here? We've got a little bit of time to study, or if there's any other questions on chemistry, I'm happy to take them. Okay.